Welcome, everyone. I'm really glad you're joining us for this session because we're going to touch on some really big questions that everyone has about uh, breeding evidence codes, uh, significant species, safe dates. We're going to talk about how to use safe date charts, um, what information to include when you um, have significant, significant species on your list. Uh, we're going to talk about common mistakes everyone makes with breeding codes and all that. And um, I can't think of a better person to talk to us about this than Mike Burrell. And Mike, uh, he's been introduced to bird at a very young age by his parents uh, as a kid outside of Waterloo. He participated in the previous Atlas. So in Atlas II, um, he took on a square near his home with his parents. And they also did some atlasing uh, in other location like uh, Algonquin and Charleston Lake. He works on many bird related projects uh, all over the province and he enjoys working in remote areas. He also uh, he's currently working with the Natural Heritage Information Center um, and his work for, focuses on uh, keeping track of rare species. So where they are, how they're doing and, and so on. So um, I bet he's really excited to uh, get see all the new information that is uh, re revealed in the Atlas. So uh, just before I let Mike start, I'm just going to repeat again for those who are just joining us. If you have technical issues, you can put it in the chat. If you do have a question on uh, the presentation on atlasing in general, put it in the Q&A so that we'll be able to see it and answer it later. And uh, I will let Mike speak. Okay, thanks, Roxanne. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get right into it then. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, uh, thanks to everybody who's already talked so far. Uh, it was great, great presentation from Mike, and um, I hope, I hope our enthusiasm for the Atlas project rubs off on all of you because um, I know a lot of you are very excited to be here and being part of the Atlas. But um, all of us that are doing these presentations and helping with the the day today, we're we're equally as excited. It's it's a very fun project to be part of. So um, this session, uh, as Roxanne said, we're, we're covering quite a bit of, of sort of technical topics uh, related to the Atlas. So we're gonna be talking about breeding codes, uh, breeding dates or safe dates as we call them sometimes. We're gonna talk about significant species and uh, then there will be time at the end for your questions. So let me just adjust some of this so I can see what I'm doing, okay. So um, getting going with breeding codes, Mike, Mike gave you a good introduction about breeding codes already, and they really are the foundation of how we collect Atlas data. So without having breeding codes attached to your records, then we're not sure, um, did you just happen to notice a species in an area and it has no breeding evidence, or is, there, is it doing something that makes you think that it is a breeding species in that area? So it is really important that you record the breeding evidence codes. There's a lot of reasons uh, we need that those codes. Um, biggest among them are is that birds do move around. So knowing the behavior that they're exhibiting um, helps us determine how likely it is that they are in fact breeding in an area. Um, it, it's a it's a foundation of how atlases have been run for quite a long time, going going back before even the first Ontario atlas. So it gives us a way to compare between atlas one, atlas two, and now atlas three. Um, they give us a way to measure how confident we are that a species is in fact breeding at a site or in a square. And as Mike touched on, they follow international standards. And I just want to stress all of the things that you're going to hear today. It's, it's a lot of information and it's the same with these breeding codes. You don't need to worry about memorizing every code. You're going to learn them whether you want to or not um, as you start atlasing. So um, don't worry about having to memorize them. So the breeding code categories, they're broken into four categories um, and they go from uh, basically in, in order of increasing confidence that the bird is actually breeding at that site. So they start with observed, then possible, probable, and confirmed. And there's different codes within 
each of those last three categories. So the observed category, this is the X code. Um, this is the X code. And so this is when you observe a species in, in breeding season, but not in breeding habitat or, or no breeding evidence is found. So um, something like a gull in a field, it's obviously not nesting there. Um, a flyover, a common loon, something like that. So that's our, our sort of no breeding evidence in the breeding season. Possible codes are the lowest level of breeding evidence. Um, so these are things like singing male, the S code, uh, or, or other adult producing sounds associated with breeding. We've got probable codes. Uh, this is the next step up. And an example of one of these is the courtship or display, the D code. And you've got these turkeys, uh, this turkey displaying um, to other turkeys. And then we've got the confirmed codes. So these are the highest level of breeding evidence. Um, and so the highest level you can get is something like these great horned owl young in a nest, the NY code. So these codes, if you wanna find them on the website, you can, you can go to the Atlas website and go under tools and resources um, and go under the coding sheets option, reading evidence codes to see a full list of them. There's um, a really handy Atlas quiz where you can quiz yourself on them. There's, Lots of codes, as I said, you don't need to worry about memorizing them. Most of them are very straightforward and are pretty self-explanatory once you've read the definition of them once or twice. <clears throat> but you can always refer back to these codes on the website. And if you're using the app, um, when you tap, tap on the breeding evidence code box um, for app submission, it will come up is, with, that, with the view that you see on the left there, the grid view. Um, so, and if you're, if you know what all the codes mean, that's really useful, but, um, when you're just starting out, um, and, or if you just haven't memorized them yet, um, then you can tap on the list view up at the, the top here, and that will switch over to the view that you see on the right. And that gives the code, but also sort of a short definition to, to jog your memory of what they are. Now, you're also probably wondering what these, what the green and yellow and red exclamation points mean. Um, so those, you'll get those warnings um, when you're doing your data entry, either on the website or the app. And if you tap on those, it will give you a definition. So the, the yellow are unusual codes and the green are caution. So unusual codes are ones that um, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna use those codes, it's really unusual for that particular species. So these are species specific sort of warnings. Um, so if you use that yellow code, then you, you're encouraged to put in some extra details when you submit your record. Um, green is just sort of like a, there to make sure you sort of double check that you didn't make a mistake. And then some codes are even set so that, um, that you can't even use the code. Those are those red ones, the invalid codes. And it's really, these are really handy, um, handy sort of reminders as you're doing your data entry. Um, because it will give you some extra information. So I've got a couple examples, um, you know, on the, in the caution is required one, I tried to use uh, the pair code. And in this case, it was a species where the male and female are identical. So it's given me a little bit of caution that it's a kind of unusual for that, that species because they're hard to tell apart. And so it's hard to know whether it is a pair. Um, in the, the next one, the unusual codes example, I clicked on a woodcock and I tried to use the S code or, or the D code. Um, and in the woodcock example, the woodcock's display is actually coded as S for a singing bird rather than D, uh, unless interaction with other woodcocks is observed. So that's the, that's the unusual code warning that pops up. And then on the last example that I'm showing here, the invalid code, um, I was doing a brownhead cowbird and I tried to put uh, the NB or nest building code. And it said I wasn't allowed to do that because in fact, cowbirds don't build nests. So these are very, very handy codes. Don't ignore them. Um, they, they really do help you learn um, not just about the species biology, but also um, about how to use those codes properly. 
So if you're looking for ways to beef up on your breeding evidence code knowledge, um, right on the website under that get involved or under the tools and resources tab again, um, there's this Atlas quiz. And this is a fun, handy little quiz. You can do one or two questions at a time, or you can spend a whole afternoon, uh, rainy afternoon maybe going through it. And it will give you scenarios and you have to guess which is the most appropriate breeding code. And it will help guide you. Um, if you're not getting the right answer, it will, will tell you sort of the rationale for why, um, what the correct code is. So that's a really great resource to be aware of. Another good resource is we have our Atlas 3 discussion forum, and this is found on the website again under Get Involved this time. There's the discussion, discussion forum option, and this will take you to the discussion forum, and we have a channel dedicated to breeding evidence codes. So if you have a question about a particular code, you can ask it here, and one of our very knowledgeable other Atlasers will come in and, and help figure out the answer to your question. So uh, I did want to go through a few common sort of questions and pitfalls that we, we sort of saw over and over again from year one. Um, so the first one is with the FY code, the recently fledged young code. And so this one, the key here in the description is that it's uh, recently fledged young. And then I've underlined there that they're incapable of sustained flight. So that, that photo on the left, that's a young sharp-tailed grouse. It can fly a little bit. Uh, but it's not capable of really sustained flight yet. It's still, um, it still definitely qualifies as this FY, so recently fledged young. The bald eagle on the right, on the other hand, that is a young bird for sure, but it is more than capable of sustained flight. It could have flown, you know, it could have flown potentially hundreds of kilometers. Um, if, so if you see a bald eagle like that in, you know, July or August, uh, that does not get coded as a fledged young. So that's something we saw a fair bit of that people were using the FY code just for sort of immature birds in late summer, um, but they've got to be that incapable of sustained flight. So that's one to, to remember. We're not seeing too many use of, of the FY code quite yet this early in the year. Another one that I think trips up some people is uh, this sort of scenario. So this is a wood thrush sitting on a nest. So is it sitting on eggs? Should you use the nest with eggs code? Is it have young in that nest? Should you use the NY code or maybe the AE adult entering code? So the thing to remember is we don't want you to guess. So from this photo, from this view, you can't tell if there's eggs, you can't tell if there's young, but you do know there's an adult sitting on a, on a nest. It's an occupied nest. So this one should get coded as AE. So we don't want you to guess whether there's eggs or young in that nest. Okay, now another one. Um, this is a Wilson snipe doing its uh, display, that, that winnowing that they make with their tail feathers. Um, sim similar, the American woodcock display where they make that whistling sound with their, their wings. Um, rough grouse drumming, woodpeckers drumming, all of those things, those are the equivalent of uh, like an American robin singing. So those should be coded with an S singing bird, um, not the D code for display. The D code could be used if you know that there's some interaction going on between multiple individuals of the same species. So think back to that turkey example I showed where there's a, a wild turkey and he's displaying to other wild turkeys. That's when you use that D code. And finally, I'll give you one more. And this is one where um, I think a lot of people didn't realize that they could up their breeding evidence code. So if you see a, uh, something like a barn swallow disappearing into a barn or under a bridge, uh, this is a perfect, a perfect use of the V code, a bird visiting a probable nest site in suitable nesting habitat during the species breeding season. So you can use the V code um, but again, we don't want you to guess and say that they're entering a nest unless you have a really strong reason to believe there's a nest there. But if there's probably a nest, uh, a probable nest site under a bridge or in a barn, you can use that for things like barn swallows and pigeons and things like that. Okay, so I'm gonna keep moving along. We're moving on to the breeding dates, safe dates stuff. 
So, and this is really like three, three little mini presentations in one, and we'll get to the questions at the end. So uh, this is what our breeding charts look like. And, and if this is the first time you've seen one of these, you're probably going cross-eyed and trying to figure out what the heck's going on. It looks overwhelming, um, but in, in actual fact, once you get down to the, to the sort of the core of what it, what it is, uh, which we're gonna do right now, um, it's fairly straightforward. The, the, the whole idea with these breeding calendars, breeding dates, safe dates, is to make sure that you're using caution when we're outside of those core atlasing times of year, that, that core atlasing season in sort of late May to early July. Uh, when we're in sort of the shoulder seasons like we are right now, there's lots of birds still in migration and some of those might show some sort of low breeding evidence. So we want you to use caution in, in those situations. And so these, these are basically calendars to help you know um, whether we're into sort of a safe period for atlasing for the species and you can use less caution or if you should sort of elevate your caution. So there's three different breeding charts. They're broken down by the three major ecozones. So there's the Hudson Plains, the Boreal Shield and Mixedwood Plains. So each one of those ecozones has its own safe dates chart. So, and then within each chart, there's an entry for each species. So here's our Scarlet Tanager entry. And so what this is showing, um, it's showing you basically uh, in white when the species is absent from, from that area. And then in the colored section, so from early May to early October, when it's present. Okay, so that's, that's when it's present. Those are the colors. Then it's broken down further. You've got blue and yellow. And so blue is when the species is in its breeding season. So that's that May 6th to July 8th, could be breeding at that time of year. The yellow is showing the migration season and where the yellow and blue overlap, that's shown as blue, or shown as light blue. So the light blue is the time of year um, when it could be breeding, but it could just be a migrant. So you gotta use caution at that time of year. And then the dark blue is when it's, it should be breeding and the migration of this species should be over. So it's what we call the safe dates. So if you wanna find these charts, um, they're found under tools and resources on the website under the coding sheets uh, and safe breeding dates. We've got them sorted. Um, you, one version is sorted in taxonomic order and one is in chronological order. The chronological is really handy this time of year if you wanna see what's sort of in season right now. Um, but if you just wanna check up on a species, you can check the taxonomic order. So. So on that page, there's also some instructions and a link to um, the Appendix H, which is the safe dates and breeding dates portion of the Atlas manual. And that goes into more detail about uh, which breeding codes you should be using at different times of year. So we, it's got the whole list of breeding codes. As I said earlier, um, you know, as we go through that list, we basically get increasing confidence that breeding is really occurring. Um, and and don't you don't need to memorize this this right now. Obviously, it's it's found in that in the manual. But in some some of those um, breeding evidence codes, especially those ones near the top, so things like um, X and the H code, which is for a species in suitable habitat, or the S code, just a singing bird, the multiple code. So when when you have multiple seven plus singing individuals in a square on the same date, those codes really can be shown at any, any time of year. Um, so, you know, you could, have, you could have seven singing yellow rumped warblers in a, in a park right now because they're, they're in migration, they're passing through right now. So because we're not in the safe dates, you wanna avoid the use of those codes at this time of year. We're in this period where you need to use extreme caution for that, for, for some species that are out of their safe dates. As you move down into the more sort of confident breeding codes, um, then you can use some of those outside of the safe dates, as long as you sort of add some notes and follow some of the exceptions that, that where they're allowed. But obviously, if you see a bird building a nest, uh, it's building a nest and it's nesting, it's breeding. So uh, those sorts of examples where it leaves no doubt that it's in fact a breeding bird and not a, not a migrant passing through, um, obviously go ahead and, and code those with breeding evidence codes in your checklists. So just so just a few reminders, 
Um, use those guides when you're outside of that core breeding season from late May to early July. They're meant to be a guide. They're not um, like set in stone. Um, there will be exceptions and we're seeing it for sure um, with, with, it seems to be birds are increasing or sort of moving their breeding seasons up faster and faster every year. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is those eco zones, they're really big. So um, it's sort of set as the average for the, the middle of those eco zones. So if you're at the very south edge of the boreal shield eco zone, zone you might be a little closer to some of the mixed wood plains dates than you would be if you're at the north end of that, of that big eco zone. If you're reporting stuff outside of the safe dates um, and uh, it's those other codes, those sort of low level codes, then please do add some comments to justify why, you're, why you think you should do so. Um, if you have comments to improve them, please let us know. And just like the breeding evidence codes, if you have questions about these, uh, please go to the, the Atlas discussion forum and there's a channel dedicated to the safe dates and breeding dates um, sort of stuff. And you can ask your questions there and, and one of Atlas staff or another Atlaser uh, will help answer those questions. Okay, we're moving along, this is good. Um, so we'll have lots of time for questions and, and maybe a, a short break before our next speaker too. So we're on to the third final uh, little mini mini presentation here. This one's um, about significant species. And we've got a nice prothonotary warbler down there. Okay, so what is a significant species? These are species that we've identified cent centrally um, to apply a regional or provincial designation um, for different species based on you know, their, their status, based on their sort of the trends of their population, could be based on their um, species at risk status or the fact that they're colonial species. So we've got three different classifications and you might've noticed those funny symbols beside a species name when you're doing an Atlas checklist. So that, that first symbol, we call that a dagger. That's, those are provincially rare species. The next symbol that's we call the double dagger. Uh, and really, when I say we call them, that's what I call them. Um, that's the regionally rare species. And then the symbol that I call the double S is the species of interest. So the provincially rare, these are things like Henslow sparrow. They're very, very rare breeding species in the province. Most of them have um, some sort of species at risk designation. Usually they're endangered or threatened. Um, but they have very, they're very rare breeders across the entire province. Um, and so we want documentation for all breeding records in the province. So if you enter a record of a, a Henslow Sparrow and you add any breeding evidence to that record, then it's gonna flag it for more details. Regionally rare species, um, these are set at the region level and so what could be what's regionally rare in one region might not be in the next region. It really depends on the status of that species in that region as a breeding species. So for instance, we've got a Swainson's thrush here, and this would be regionally rare in most of southwestern Ontario. So let's say region seven, Waterloo, um, it would be regionally rare there. So if you entered a Swainson's thrush record and added any breeding evidence code to it, then it's going to flag it for more details because it's a very rare breeding species in that region. But if you see a Swainson's thrush in region 43 in uh, the Hudson Bay Lowlands, uh, it's not gonna be flagged as regionally rare in that area because it's a fairly common breeder in that, that area. So there is some variation from region to region based on what you might get flags, uh, ask for more details for. And then our third category, the species of interest. This is sort of a, uh, it covers a few different types of, of species. So it includes all of our colonial species like great blue heron. Uh, it includes widespread species at risk. So things like uh, barn swallow, things like bobolink and Eastern meadowlark. And it also includes other priority species um, that there's some sort of conservation concern around them. So it could be that they're just poorly known species uh, it could be that um, could be that they're sort of uh, watch list species, species that we think might become species at risk in the future or that we have concerns about their population. So these species 
um, that we're only going to flag for details if you enter confirmed level breeding evidence. But if you can add details and uh, add pins for the locations of these, um, that's that's great. That's great for us as well. So the more information you can provide, the better. Now, there's other reasons that a record might get flagged. Um, the first one is that it triggers an eBird flag. So in the background, running through our nature count system, when you enter Atlas records, they go through the, the filters, the same filters that records that go into eBird go through. So these are based on time of year and the location. So it could be flagged because it's a true rarity for that part of the province. It could be just that it's out of season or that it's a high count. So you could get a flag, um, you could get your records flagged for this reason as well. And then the final reason you might get asked for details is because you used unusual breeding codes. And we talked about this back in the, the breeding evidence codes section. Um, so you might, might be asked for more details for this reason as well. So there's lots of reasons it's very important for, for us to get documentation from you on these significant species. Um, first of all, it's really important to, because it helps us verify the, the record. Um, so some species are really tricky. Here's, this is an Acadian flycatcher. Um, so we might want lots and lots of details on how you eliminated other similar species, especially if it's in a, in a new place where we didn't know Acadian flycatchers were. So we, we need to be able to verify the record, especially for these rare species. The other reason we need information is we need the, the extra details just to help with things like conservation planning. So lots of them are species at risk. Um, so we need, we just need more information for these rare species that are getting flagged for details. So any, any extra information you can provide will go a long way. So how do you document? Uh, there's lots of, of stuff that we would like. The most important things are we need a description of the bird and its behavior. A lot of the other information that we want is already included in your Atlas checklist. So we know the date, we know the time, we know how many individual birds you had. Um, we know the breeding evidence code and we know the location. Um, we would really like you to add a pin. So drop the exact location where the species that, that particular bird was found. Um, but we also, we really need the description of the bird. Things like how, uh, what similar species did you consider? How did you eliminate them? How familiar are, are you with that species that you're reporting? A description of the habitat is very helpful. And same with a description of the behavior. So uh, it's useful for us to help confirm that you use the proper breeding evidence code for these rare species as well. If you've got photos or audio recordings, uh, please mention those in your comments. Um, if you're if you're sharing your nature counts list, your atlas list with eBird, you can just make a note that you're adding the media to your eBird list. That's very helpful. But otherwise, if you're not, make a note that you're adding, you've got them so that a reviewer can contact you. Now, all of this, this information doesn't just disappear. Uh, it's used by the regional coordinators. They review your records first. So, so any flagged record gets reviewed by a regional coordinator, and then it moves on and it gets reviewed a second time by the significant species committee as sort of a provincial level review. So, so all of your records that get flagged, all these significant species records, they get reviewed twice. And so we really do need the extra information to be able to, to verify the records. So when you're doing a checklist on the website, um, you can you can get to, uh, once, once you've been prompted that you need more details on a particular record, then you can click that little add details box beside the species name. There, there it is. So that's the add details box. So once you've clicked that, it will open up another box. And that's where you can add your details, um, your text-based details. So all those things I just talked about, a description of the species, how, similar species, how you eliminated those similar species, a little bit of description about the behavior, um, those sorts of things. Um, then the next thing we want you to do is click on that coordinates tab up at the top, and that's where you can drop your pins uh, for what you saw. 
or where you saw it. So when you click on the coordinates, uh, it opens up a map. This shows eBird hotspots in the area, shows the square boundary, and it shows your track log if you had one. Um, I find it easier to switch to satellite view. The default it starts with is map view. So I always switch to satellite view and then zoom in on the area where you were. And then you can plot um, some pins. So in this example, I actually plotted two different pins. Uh, and you can plot a pin. Technically, you can plot a pin for every single individual you saw. It's it's not necessarily for, for every species, but for these significant species, we want as much information as possible. With each pin, you can add the number of individuals as well as the breeding evidence code observed at that particular pin. So this is really, really vital information for, to help us uh, for verifying the record, but also for future conservation work related to these, these data you've collected. On the app, it's very similar. Mike already mentioned it, but you can add your, your, your breeding evidence code and your count to the species. Then you tap on the species name and that will give you access to the details box where you put in your description and all the other text-based information. And then you can also tap the location box, which will give you the access to the pinning option. You'll zoom in on the map again, just like on the website version. You drop your pin and you can add in the number of individuals. Mike was showing you a sneak peek of what, what we'll be getting on the, the app uh, at the next release. And the next release will allow you to also add the breeding evidence code for each individual pin. So it's very simple to drop those pins. And I can't stress, I can't stress enough how important it is for us to get good descriptions to help us verify the species you're reporting for these significant records, but also we need these pins to be able to, to, to map these records as precisely as possible. So um, just to quick recap on the, the different information that we want. We don't, we don't need you to write a giant paragraph, giant novel for these records. Um, and some, of the, some records like the species of interest, we really don't even need much of those details. We really are, are wanting the pins for those species of interest. But for the rare species, the regionally rare, the provincially rare, and those eBird records, we really do need you to add extra details about how you identified the species, how you eliminated similar species. Any extra details you can provide are really helpful. But in all those, we really want a pin. Um, so we, we know where that species was precisely as possible found. So this table is actually taken right out of the most recent Atlas newsletter, if you want to refer back to it ever. So just to, to wrap up on the significant species mini presentation, um, paying, paying attention for these, these rare species is, is really, it is fun. Um, and finding them and documenting them is, is just another challenge of the Atlas, another aspect of the Atlas. But for these significant species, your data are extra meaningful. So uh, we really want you to do as, as good a job as possible providing these extra details. If you want to practice, you can practice um, adding good notes and pins with common species, um, but don't forget to add those pins especially. If you find something exciting, you can document them with photos and video and audio. Um, share them with us if you, if you, if you can. Um, share them with your RC. I'm sure they'd be interested in seeing them. If you have questions about documenting a record, talk to the, your RC. And in a lot of cases, it's very helpful if you can let your RC know, uh, especially if it's a very, very unusual find or um, you're not quite sure. It's great if you can let your RC know right as soon as you found them. And then maybe you, you can arrange for some follow-up uh, because sometimes it, a second visit is very helpful for these significant species records. If you're looking for more information about significant species, um, it's found in Appendix K of the Atlas Manual. So with that, I will move on to our question period. So I think I'm gonna stop sharing and Roxanne's coming back, great. Yes, we have, uh, we have many great questions. Well, thank you, Mike. That was lots of great information. And Mike's right when he says you don't need to know all that by heart because 
in the field, you will come across situations where he'll have a question. So I put the link to the Discord uh, server in the app and I'll start uh, the questions now. The first one, if we use Nature Count app and we have our list uploaded to eBird automatically, how does it handle sensitive species? Yeah, okay, good question. So, so sensitive, so there, we do have some species in the Atlas that are listed as sensitive. And you know what, I actually have a slide of this. I came prepared. So I'm gonna go back to show, give me a second here. I should have just left this in the presentation. All uh, right, there it is. Okay, so sensitive species. Um, there's there's a small portion of, of species in the atlas that we've identified as sensitive species that we're concerned that if the exact location, especially, um, were to be revealed to the, to the general public, it could detriment be detrimental to that species. Um, RCs have the ability to mark individual records of, of species of other species as sensitive, um, and no records get uh, will appear in, in, on the atlas maps until an RC has reviewed them. Um, and let me move. I have one more slide here. So this is an example of how sensitive species work in. The atlas. So a song sparrow, you can see the exact locations of records that are in the atlas. The northern hawk owl, you only see the squares where they've been found. And I'll pull up a list here. This is a list of what are sensitive species treated in the atlas. So now I know the question was about how what happens when, when it goes to eBird. And so we can't control what happens when it goes to eBird. So uh, if you are reporting a record uh, or details of a record or a sensitive species, and you're concerned with it going to eBird, then, then I would strongly suggest you turn off that automatic feature in your Nature Counts account. Um, if you're not sure if it's on or off, then just don't submit your Atlas record from your phone uh, until you've gotten home and checked on your computer and checked the settings. So sometimes I'll do that if I've got a record, a checklist in my, in my Nature Counts app and I don't want it to go into eBird right away, I just save it to my drafts and then, um, I submit it later on once I've toggled my setting off so that it doesn't automatically share to eBird. eBird has its own sensitive species protocol. It's fairly similar, but it's not the exact same species list. So yeah, something good point and something to be aware of for sure. Thank you, Mike. Um, two other uh, people had questions about who sees the location. So that answered uh, the question. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll make one quick comment. So. The, the, this is one thing that is nice about the pinning of records. So if you are sharing a checklist to eBird, the checklist location goes to eBird, but those pins do not go to eBird. So those pins are only visible to RCs and the provincial review team and the observer, obviously. Excellent. So I have a question here from Dorothy who asks, if a Phoebe nests every year in the same place, do we record it as breeding again every time? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and so this is, this is definitely something that is a bit different from Atlas 2 and Atlas 1. We are collecting data in Atlas 3 on a checklist basis. So I would think of each time you do a checklist, Think of it as basically independent of every other Atlas checklist that's ever been done. The only exception to that is there's two breeding evidence codes that are a little, that require information from previous checklists. So the T code, the T code is that a bird has been displaying territorial behavior at least seven days apart. So you can't use a T code unless you know what's happened seven plus days ago. So that's the one exception. The other exception is the M code for multiple singing individuals. Um, so you could have uh, you could have, you know, five uh, metal arcs on one checklist, another metal arc on a second checklist, and then if you've got a seven another single metal arc on a third checklist, same square, same day, 
then on that third checklist, all of a sudden you can start using the M code. But other than those two weird examples, you can treat your, um, your checklists independently. And the more of these checklists we have, the better it is for the people who are gonna analyze the data to make all these amazing maps that Mike was showing. So yeah, absolutely record that Phoebe Nest, not only every year, but every checklist you do. If, if, there's, if you can check on a Phoebe Nest for you know, a month straight, you can do a checklist. You can do a checklist several times a day. <laughs> That's great, thank you. And that also answers uh, Cheryl's question about uh, the M code, which you explained uh, very well, thank you. And someone asks, uh, why do we need to add an X as a code? Can't we leave it blank as it indicates the same thing? So just the elaboration on X a little bit. Yeah, that's a, that is a good question. Um, I guess you're, you're, you're right. The question answer is right. It doesn't make much difference, but it, it does. It, it could potentially help us in the future to know that you, you purposely thought about it. Um, but I wouldn't lose any sleep over if you forgot to add an X here and there. Um, I don't know, Mike, are you on still? If you have any thoughts on that one? Probably take yeah, a No, I'm, <laughs> I'm here. I'm just trying to find my mute button. Um, yeah, you're right. It really doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but as you say, it, it indicates some thought went into the, into the process. And from that perspective, it's helpful. Okay. All of us need to ask questions sometimes, so. So uh, Dave asks a good question. He sees a turkey vulture being seen entering a derelict barn. Would this be considered enough for a V-code? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was reading, there was this very question came up on the discussion forum about two weeks ago. Um, so I, I, I did some reading on turkey vulture breeding behavior and I was interested to find out that they start um, they start visiting those sites um, several weeks before they might even start laying eggs. So, um, and they lay their eggs surprisingly early. So yeah, definitely V code turkey vulture going in and out of an old barn. That's a that's a great code to use. And you can really if you drive around right now, there's there's lots of them doing that in southern Ontario. Thank you. Okay, I had one regarding um, the FY code at a feeder. Uh, Joan asks uh, that most, mo since most of her observation are at her feeders, uh, she doesn't know how well they can fly, but they did have a number of young born. And when the number grew, uh, some evidence of adults feeding their young from food from the feeder, can they use the FY code? Yeah, that's a hard one without without knowing a bit more how, how young they were, but it sounds like it. Yeah, if they're feeding young and they're they're obviously young of the year, then then I would say most likely you can use the FY code unless they're like very, very mature young. But it sounds sounds like an ex a time that FY would be reasonable. Thank you. Um, I have a question about when the language says in the breeding season. Does that mean the light blue or just the safe date range? Yeah, it, it depends on the breeding code. So if it says in the breeding season, so for those, the S code and the H code and the M code, um, those ones, it needs, we, we, it needs to be in that safe dates. But for the other codes, it can be any of the blue in, the, in that breeding season. So lighter or dark blue. Okay, now I have a question from Douglas about owl surveys. They are often scheduled outside of uh, the safe dates. So he asked, can singing owls be considered possible breeding despite that if only heard on one occasion? Yeah, so um, they shouldn't be out of the safe dates. And I know there's an error on the Northern Sawwet owl safe dates, which we just haven't got the update up onto the website. So if you're hearing um, an owl, if it's the target species that you're hearing or one of the target species, then then 
we wouldn't have we the uh, the scheduled dates of those surveys are within safe dates. If they if there's a discrepancy, then it's just because we've got an error on our safe dates chart. <laughs> okay, perfect. Now I have a question from April who says, for bluebirds examining nesting areas and paired already, how would you code that? So, uh, I mean, the very least you can use the P code, the pair code. Um, if they're visiting, if, if they're carrying like nesting material, then you can do NB, the nest building code, if they're bringing stuff in and out of a nest box. Um, yeah, and, it, and if, I mean, if they're disappearing in the nest boxes for extended periods of time, then, then you could probably use the AE code, adult entering, indicating an occupied nest. Okay, perfect. I have a question here from Linda, who says, it's a really good question. If uh, she is close to the boundary of the safe date zones that you showed, how does she know which zone um, to use? Yeah, it's a good question. And this kind of goes back to what I said, that these are guides, right? I, and so you, you've got to use your best guess. And I mean, so, and this goes to what I said too about, you know, the eco zones are really big. So if you are right at the south end of the boreal shield, then maybe it is, is a little more appropriate to follow the mixed wood planes or, or be somewhere around those dates. If you're not sure, right, the, the main thing about these dates is we want you to use caution. So think critically about, is this bird likely to be sticking around and nesting? Or is it probably just a migrant that's passing through? If you're not, if you're not really sure and you're kind of on the borderline, then treat it kind of as though you're not in the safe dates. And you know, so if you if you've got a bird and it's just singing and you're you're not sure if you're in the, the safe dates or not, then wait a week, see if it's still there, and then you can use that T code because it's maintaining a territory kind of thing. Or try to follow it around and find it building a nest. And that's always. That's always really good. Thank you. Um, okay, someone is asking, uh, is Merlin considered a reliable source for confirming the bird ID based on the recorded song? A uh, good question. So Merlin, uh, Merlin is like, um, Merlin, so Merlin doesn't tell you what something is. That's, that's I think something, that's important to realize. Merlin gives you suggestions on what it could be. And sometimes those suggestions are right and sometimes they're not. So I wouldn't rely solely on Merlin. It's very good, but if Merlin suggests it's one thing, um, you still it's still up to you to uh, independently verify that kind of. So um, if you're doing audio, then you can make a recording. Um, you can go onto the discussion form and plop that recording up and see if other people agree. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't rely solely on Merlin, just like I wouldn't rely on like photo recognition within Merlin either. They're, they're usually really good suggestions, but I've seen some, some pretty bad suggestions as well. <laughs> yes. Okay, I'll get a couple more and then we'll uh, stop for a little break. I have a, a good one. Are duetting owls coded S, P, or D? Yeah, uh, I was asking this. I was asking this question to Don Sutherland the about two weeks ago. He's a very experienced atlaser, and his his suggestion was probably should go in as P. So so duetting owls, if you can tell that it's a male and a female. So great horned owls are a really good example. I think you had this exact scenario too, Roxanne. I did. Um, so yeah, great horned owl, you can tell them apart, but the sex is apart. The, the females has a much lower call than the male. Um, so if, if you hear them back and forth, you can often tell it's a male and a female. Um, so if that's the case, then you can count it as a pair um, as the best code. Perfect. Now another one about codes. If a morning dove is pursuing another one, is that considered to be code D or song sparrows chasing each other, perhaps being territorial? 
Yeah, if, if it's like a very aggressive chasing, then yeah, I would count that as D. Um, you know, if it's a male, two males chasing each other or a male and a female chasing each other, yeah, I would code that as a D. Okay. I think we have time for one last one. Uh, someone asks, uh, I didn't Atlas last year, but I am this year. Can I somehow submit birds I saw last year with definite breeding codes? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, welcome. Welcome to the Atlas. Um, and absolutely, if you've got data from last year, you can put that in. Uh, you can use the app. Just make sure you set the date and time correctly. You can use the website. If you've got your data in eBird, it's really easy to import the checklists um, into the Atlas. That's, uh, I think that's our last session of the day that Kaylin's going to be doing about data entry and using, using nature counts. So absolutely, if you know, if you recorded the breeding evidence, then um, please do get that data in. It's not too late to get year one data in at all. Okay. Um, now, I think we were scheduled to take a small break because we're... Um... It's 2.53 already. I don't know if we have time for another one. Well, why don't we go to 2.55 if there's still questions and then we can give everybody a five minute break before the three o'clock session. Perfect. Now, Kristen asks, uh, we've had barn swallows nesting in the same nest for the past seven years. Do we have to wait until the safe dates to record them entering the nest or can we record the earliest date we saw them sitting on the nest? Yeah, so you've got a few options. So, uh, your, I mean, your first option is you can use the NU code, the use nest code, um, before they even start using the nest. Um, so you can use that option. Um, if they're going into the nests and you're outside of the safe dates, then I would I would use the the AE code, adult entering code. Um, that's so. Remember, the safe dates is really to weed out the ones that could be migrants. And so like, if you just see a barn swallow in your backyard or you, um, you know, flying over someplace and it's not safe dates, then, you know, we have no way to know, is that really an H or is that just a bird passing through? So that's why outside of the safe dates, we want you to use caution for those sort of the lower codes. But if it's exhibiting really solid breeding evidence, like building a nest or entering a nest, um, then go ahead and use that any time in the breeding season, even outside of the safe dates. Thank you. Uh, John asks, if you discover a bird that is out of place, so blown in, blown in by a storm or a rare visitor like a painted bunting, that's exciting. Is it okay to record it as being seen or does that just add excess clutter to the Atlas data? Yeah, no, go ahead and add it. Um, you wouldn't be adding breeding evidence in most cases. So, I mean, we're, the Atlas is really concerned with records that have breeding evidence attached to them, right? So uh, definitely go ahead and add it. Doesn't, doesn't hurt to add a record, even if it's got no breeding evidence. It won't be used for the Atlas, most likely, if there's no breeding evidence attached to it. But uh, yeah, don't worry about making extra work for us. Okay. And... Um... I think we spoke about this. Uh, Jane Ann asks, are there lists of species requiring special documentation by region? Now those would be the significant species. Uh, yeah, so I'll let Mike talk to that. Yeah, there is. I gotta remember where these are. Uh... I know on the regional checklist, you can see the little, um, I yeah. like to carry one with me to see the little signals you showed earlier, right on the checklist. Yeah, I'm just drawing a blank, a mental break, blank, blank on how to find those. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but yes, there is a regional checklist for each region. Yes. Um, and Kaylin's, Kaylin's mentioning that, uh, yeah, on your square summary sheets as well. And those I know how to get to. Those are under resources, Atlas Square resources. You can get your square summary sheet. It'll list all the expected species with the code. But there is a there is a like a regional checklist for each region. And I am. Yeah, <laughs> I this one you can find for the um, 
uh, I think it's in instructions and forms on the right side there, you'll see the list of all the regions. So each region has their own checklist. I love those checklists. I fold it in my pocket because you have all the little signals for this significant species, as well as the little box with all the breeding codes and the definitions. So it's a real handy tool. Yeah, I just checked. You're right, Roxanne, thanks. So yeah, under tools and resources, instructions and forms. And then on the right, there's these printable Atlas data forms and there's a, a regional checklist for each region. So thank Perfect. you for your help on that one, Roxanne. Perfect. And this concludes our question and we had lots of great questions. Uh, the yeah. last one is how do we join the Discord, Discord uh, discussion group, which is a really good question because any other question you have, you, you can go there. And I see that Natasha put it on the chat and Mike just put it, oh, he put the instruction to the checklist as well. So if you go two comments over Mike's comment, you will see the link that leads you to the Atlas 3 discussion forum. Yeah, and it's under get involved discussion forum. And there's, there's a link there to join and some, a little instructional video too. Okay, so thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone.